This is Deep Dive. I'm Li Yunqi. Clashes, heavy fighting. A new round of conflict has flared up in northern Myanmar's Khao Khan region. A new grouping called the Three Brotherhood Alliance overran dozens of military posts and captured key border crossings between Myanmar and China. The rough terrain and diverse ethnic groups have been some of the major factors for the reoccurring conflicts in Khao Khan. This time, the Myanmar National Democratic Alliance Army has claimed responsibility for several offensives since late October, with an unusual objective: cracking down on online scam centers. However, the Alliance Army is not acting alone. Who else is involved in the conflict? What changes do they want to bring to Khao Khan? And more importantly, how will the conflict reshape the political and economic landscape in the region bordering China? My colleague Su Yi joins me to unravel the history of local conflicts in Myanmar. This episode is brought to you on Friday, November the twenty-fourth. So, Su Yi, what are the parties that are involved in the conflict this time in northern Myanmar's Khao Khan region? Yeah, basically, the alliance comprises three groups、uh, with extensive fighting experience: the Myanmar National Democratic Alliance Army, or MA. DAA, the Taal National Liberation Army were TNLA, and the Arakan Army were AA. They launched coordinated attacks on military posts in northern Shan State, bordering China, and took several towns.、Uh, they launched this operation they called 1027, referring to the date the assault began. So the alliance has now seized several towns and blocked vital trade routes to Myanmar's northern border. And this is actually not the first time that we are hearing armed conflict broke out in Khao Khan,、uh, with the last major one taking place approximately eight years ago in 2015. And is this time a continued conflict from the last one, or there's some difference between them? Yes, I think you can say there is definitely some sort of a continuation. For example, the last one in 2015 is also the continuation of all the conflicts before.、Mm. You know, before 2009,、uh, the Myanmar central government had no actually real military control over the region, and in 2009, the central government tried to dissolve the MADAA and absorb it into the army. Of course, you can imagine the military group rejected.、Mm. So the army went to the place, went to Kokang, and took effective control. And their leader Pong Kai Shin was driven out. So after six years, the MNDAA troops once again came out from deep forests and they tried to retake Kokang in 2015. The troops, along with his allies,、uh, like we just mentioned, the Arakan Army. And the Taal National Liberation Army fought the government force for four months. So from February until May,、uh, the army seized the, the last stronghold of the militant group, and the militant group declared ceasefire and signed a peace deal in June 2015.、Uh, so in that conflict, it's estimated、uh, that conflict left over 200 people killed, with 50,000 civilians displaced. So the central government actually has no direct control before to this, re- to、right. this region. Yeah, and maybe for a lot of times, it's the conflict between the armed forces in the local region.、Mm-hmm. Will that be the one of the reasons for the continued conflicts in this region? Yeah, I think it's definitely one of the reason because we know Myanmar is a ethnically diverse country.、Mm-hmm. There are at least one hundred ethnic groups recognized by the government, so you can imagine it's a very mixed picture, a very complicated situation. And following Myanmar's independence, several ethnic armed organizations fought for greater autonomy because in history、uh, they never came under any. Sort of a real governance from the central authority. So after independence, they fought for autonomy. But the situation、mm. changed in 1962 because in that year tensions were exacerbated. The military government took over, curtailed ethnic minorities' rights, and used scorched earth tactics against some ethnic armed organizations. And talk about the reason for those prolonged conflicts. I think geography. It's another reason, right?、Uh, we know northern Myanmar is in a very mountainous area, so、uh, the central government、uh, is not capable of exerting effective control over the region because of the geographical condition. 
And frankly, they do not have the willingness to do so because it's not cost effective. It's very hard. It's very difficult to exert effective control. So for centuries, governments in Myanmar, they had no choice but to dedicate power to local leaders or local warlords to right. to govern the region. And I always believe, talk about deep-rooted reasons, I think deep down, it's all about economy. Uh, local people in northern Myanmar, they have very limited option to develop. So naturally, I, I think they will go to those uh, great business like running underground casinos, growing opium, uh, doing illegal mining, so for a livelihood. So in essence, it is poverty and a lack of uh, development opportunity that provide the hotbed for conflicts that lasted so long. Basically, businesses that are more profitable, even if they're against the law. Right. So rough terrain and diverse ethnic groups are some of the main factors leading to the continued conflicts. And in the recent ones, it's been the Alliance Army, the MNDNA, that was trying to seize back control of Kalkan. But how did they lose control of the region in the first place? Yeah, basically, this is the history background. Uh, we talk about that conflict in 2009, but there was another very big confrontation back in 1989. Uh, so, you know, the MADAA actually split from the Communist Party of Burma in that year, in 1989. So after that, he had a ceasefire agreement with the military government since its formation. And during the years that follow, under the leadership of Peng Kaixing, he maintained the ceasefire with the government from 1989 to 2009. But like we discussed in 2009, the military tried to transform the militant group into a paramilitary force under the control of the government army. So definitely it resisted. And also Peng was driven out by his competitors from within the army and uh, the leader fled the region. So basically, the group lost control uh, of Kokan. And after Pong was forced out of Kokan, who became the ruler of this region? Yeah, so they are the so-called big family, or big uh, four family organizations, mm. and they came with the help of the government. So once again, the government relegated power to those big family to control the region. Those uh, big families are both powerful and rich, the first one is the Bai family, the most powerful one. Uh, its leader is called Bai Xiu Qian. Uh, he is the head of Kokon self administered zone, while his son, Bai Ying Chang, commands the Kokon militia force. And also, he acts the deputy director of the finance bureau. And also, his family manages a casino group. And then there is the Wei family, headed by Wei Chao Ren. Uh, that family controls a border defense battalion and is considered the only one among the four powerful families uh, that's capable of wielding any military power. Uh, the family corporate group uh, ran hospitality, entertainment, gambling, and its interests also extended into uh, Cambodia and Thailand. And there's also Liu Abao, dubbed the richest man in Kokan. And Liu Abao owns uh, casinos, uh, real estate, and allegedly had close ties with the Myanmar army. And the last one is uh, Liu Guoxi, uh, who is vice chairman of the Kokang self administered zone. Uh, his family basically specialized in mining. So you can see this very mm. complicated connection between the four families and the government and the military. Earlier, you said the people in Kokan, they had limited access to financial incomes. And uh, was there a change after these four big families took control of Kokan or it remained pretty much the same? I think uh, when it comes to great business, it remains the same. The old thing continue, uh, except opium. Actually, Khan and used to implement a policy to limit plantation of opium. But you can imagine after several years, local farmers found that growing opium is economic gains is nothing compete with uh, growing economic plantation. So some farmers uh, go back to his old business growing opium. But this time, I mean, in recent years, a very lucrative thing is definitely the uh, telecom fraud. Right. And since 2015, Mm, the big picture is law enforcement from China and Southeast Asia cracked down on telecom fraud and 
online gambling in this area, basically uh, driving out telecom f- scammers from other countries. So they, hundreds of thousands of telecom frauder, frosters from countries like Cambodia and from regions like Taiwan, uh, they dispersed and they came to northern Myanmar and extending their reach along the Thailand-Myanmar border, encompassing areas like Mawadi, Tachlek, Wa State, Kokhan, and Muse. So in these apparent zones of lawlessness and fraudulent operation and online scam centers have grown and checked. So over the years, hundreds of thousands of telecom fraudsters from China crossed the border illegally to settle in Chinese communities in northern Myanmar because we know in Kokong, that place Mandarin is spoken and the Chinese currency Yuan uh, is used. Mm-hmm. So people from Chinese mainland, those scammer will have found no difficulty doing business there. Okay, so there's no barrier in communication with the victims. Right. And I believe to telecom frauds or these online scamming business is something new that people uh, in Mm -hmm. Kokan, they have learned recently because uh, the online frauds, they are actually catching a lot of attention in Mm -hmm. China this year. And apart from these attention on social media, actually Chinese government also issued warrants for some of the members of these families. Mm Are these families behind a lot of these online scams that we have heard about this year? What's the most recent update in this? So, of course, definitely it's one of their major source of um, income, economic gain. All four families have telecom fraud centers operating on their properties. Uh, Telecom scam is one of their major source of income. So they build those huge office compounds and they provide the necessary working place for uh, scammers. So definitely they control a certain part of the business. They don't do actual scamming work, but they just provide environment mm. for this business to grow. Uh, one thing must be clear, uh, predominantly, uh, the masterminds behind these telecom fraud schemes actually are Chinese nationals from mm. southeastern China. They came to northern Myanmar with a lot of cash. They set up their operation, they acquire land, and they build facilities, or at least pre-existing buildings, and invest in equipment and labor. So the big families, uh, they extend protection in exchange for a share of the profits. They've got a warrant from Chinese government. Mm. And uh, is the Chinese government making any progress in this? Yeah, definitely. I think so far until this November, I mean, the most significant part came uh, after September until now. So one operation actually led to the capture of three leaders of a telecom fraud group. Uh, in Kokam, Ming, so the Ming family, Ming Guoqing, Ming Zhulan, and Ming Zhenzhen, they were listed as wanted by Chinese public security organs. And also the ring leader of the group, Ming Xuechang, committed suicide before Myanmar police could arrest him. Mm. And also another recent update is local authorities have also issued arrest warrants for members of the Bai family. So I think it's uh, clear that until now, I mean, the end of 2023, it's clear the so-called four families, they are on the brink of a major collapse because not just uh, Chinese authorities issue warrants, but local authorities, Myanmar authorities also issue arrest warrants for them. I guess the military government, they found the four families gradually are losing their lure, losing their, I mean, value to the government. Right. Mm-hmm. And they perhaps at some point, uh, these families, they have grown so big mm-hmm. and they have become a problem yeah. that the local government also needs to solve it. Right. And back to the conflict uh, between the Alliance Army and my understanding between them and the big four families. It's been going on for a while. And where could this time's conflict go? Could it end up differently from the previous ones? I think it's uh, still ongoing and difficult to say because like, like we just discussed, uh, this kind right. of a conflict just reoccur year after year right. in late 1980 to early 2000s. Uh, but this time, most analysts say it's the biggest military challenge uh, to the Myanmar military authorities since the 2021 coup. That's a sure thing. Uh, but personally, I think it's still uh, to be observed because it is such an asymmetric conflict because we know the government force, they have heavy weapons. Weapons, but those uh, militant group they also uh, they only have light weapons, right. and also the central government already declared a state of emergency and mobilized forces 
uh, actual forces from other places. So I mean, the end story is, is still too early to to say. It's hard to predict where the conflict could go. Right. But、uh, in terms of the consequences of these big four families, like the illicit industries, will we maybe possibly At least to see these illegal activities being eliminated in Kalkan. Right. I I think this is the certain part because the MNDAA, when they、uh, initiate the military operation, one of the the banner, one of the slogan, they have this.、Uh, they try to root out、uh, telecom fraud.、Oh. So they found this is a very leg- legitimate、uh, cause to launch a military attack. So I I think. I don't believe scammers can go back to northern Myanmar for a, a long period of time. That place is not suitable for any for this kind of a business.、Uh, but unfortunately,、uh, like we discuss、uh, in this episode, the root problem, the deep down problem, is not being addressed because scammers can go to other places and continue. Their business, like before, they came from、uh, the Taiwan region. They came from Cambodia and other southeastern region. They came to Myanmar, but when they are driven out from this region, they simply can go to other places. For example, Dubai.、Uh, now, some media reports say Dubai is becoming a new hub for telecom fraud because、um, the organizing structure of the business, the organizing structure, like the top ring leader, is still there. They just fled to other countries. They have a lot of money, so they can basically live in other places in the world. So when they found that place,、uh, the condition is suitable, they will, I mean, fly to that place and do the business again. And more importantly, when it comes to northern Myanmar, I think local people still do not have a sustainable method for livelihood. So that's the root cause. So development is the fundamental solution. Without development. I think it's just a vicious circle. So maybe just like the continued conflicts in this region, the fight against the illegal industries will also be a consistent one. All right.、Well. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Sui.、Uh, thanks. As of this Friday, the conflict in Kalkan is still ongoing and has spilled into several nearby regions. Although it's not yet clear how the conflict will eventually turn out. The established ruling families and their online scamming operations are crumbling. 31,000 suspects have been extradited from Myanmar to China, including 63 core members of the four big families. Over 1,500 suspects under the warrant are still on the run. The steep slopes and dense forests in Kalkan have been effective in concealing a fast-growing underworld business. But now they appear incapable of withstanding the growing rage of people from both within and across the border. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Deep Dive. If you enjoyed what you just heard, don't forget to follow us on your podcast platform. Just search for Deep Dive. You can also leave comments to let us know what you want to learn about China and beyond. This episode is brought to you by me, Li Yunqi, and my colleagues Fei Fei, Zhang Zhang, and Qi Zhi. Special thanks to CGTN radio host Su Yi. I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.